Chapter 1. Despite all the evidence to the contrary, we hold on to the belief that nothing is easier than to love. Many humans have this erroneous assumption that there is nothing to be learned about love. We see love as a pleasant sensation that we only get to experience as a matter of chance, something we only get to fall into if we are lucky. Eric Fromm's argument in this book centers on the fact that love, contrary to popular belief, is an art that requires knowledge and effort. This attitude that there isn't anything to learn about love is based on several premises that have taken root in our societies for ages. One of these premises, which is mainly used by men, is to be as successful, rich, and powerful as they can be. Another, used mainly by women, is to make themselves attractive by cultivating their body and dressing fashionably. Men and women also make themselves attractive by being helpful and modest, learning how to carry a conversation, developing good manners, and being polite. In our culture, what most people mean by being lovable is essentially a mixture between being popular and having sex appeal. Eric Fromm Another reason behind this flagrant attitude of ours is the belief that love is simple, but finding the right object to love or be loved by is hard. In our culture, there is a prevalence of marketing orientation, and we attach too much value to material success. So it's not surprising that our love follows the same pattern that governs the market. When a man is in search of a partner, he subconsciously believes that he's after a prize, an attractive girl. For a woman, the prize she's after is an attractive man. Attractive, in this sense, usually means a nice package of the most popular and the most sought-after qualities in the personality market. Hence, when two people fall in love, they often believe that they found the best object available on the market, considering the limitations of their own exchange values. Our misconception about love is also due to the confusion between the first experience of falling in love and the continuous state of being or standing in love. When two people who have been strangers suddenly let their walls down and become intimate, they enjoy a very exhilarating experience. As these two people become more acquainted, however, their intimacy loses its touch and the initial excitement eventually fizzles out. In a nutshell, despite all the evidence to the contrary, the attitude that nothing is easier than to love has remained the prevalent idea about love in our society. Chapter 2. The mastery of the art of love requires theoretical as well as practical knowledge. The most effective way to overcome the failure of love that is rampant today is to examine the reason for this failure and take time to learn about the true meaning of love. First, we have to accept that love is an art, just as living is an art. To learn how to love, we must approach love the same way we approach any other form of art we want to learn, such as medicine, music, and painting. The process of learning an art can be divided into two broad parts, the mastery of the theory and the mastery of the practice. To learn the art of medicine, for instance, one must first know the facts about the human body and about various diseases. After acquiring extensive theoretical knowledge, the person then goes on to master this art through a great deal of practice. We can only attain mastery when the results of our theoretical knowledge and the results of our practice are blended into one, our intuition, the essence of mastery. Besides learning the theory and practice, another crucial factor to the mastery of an art is that becoming a master in that art must be of ultimate concern. Nothing else on earth must be as important as that art we seek to master. This holds for love just as much as it holds for medicine, music, and painting. The fact that love requires such a great devotion is perhaps the reason why the vast majority of us rarely learn this art. In spite of our innate craving for love, we attach more importance to almost everything else than love. We spend all our energy pursuing success, prestige, money, and power, sparing none to learn the art of love. The only things we see as worthy of being learned are the things with which we can earn money or prestige. Love, unfortunately, only profits the soul and doesn't give material profit. So we treat it as a luxury that isn't worth spending much energy on. In the coming chapters of this summary, we will dive deeper into Eric Fromm's theories of love and his take on the practice of love. Chapter 3. Love, in its mature form, is the solution to the problem of humanity's existence. One unique feature of our existence as humans is that we evolved from the animal kingdom and transcended nature itself. Even though we still live in nature, we've been irreparably torn away from it. No matter how hard we try, we can never attain our state of original oneness with nature. We will always remain separate from it. Hence, the only way forward for man is to develop his reason by seeking a new kind of harmony, one with his fellow men, in place of harmony with nature, which is irretrievably lost. 
As Eric Fromm puts it, love solves the problem of humankind's existence. To overcome the innate separateness and aloneness we feel, we seek to achieve union to transcend our own lives and find atonement. This natural desire for interpersonal fusion is the most powerful urge in man. It is the basic passion, the very force which keeps humanity united. Being unable to achieve this fusion results in insanity and destruction, self-destruction or destruction of others. Without love, humanity could never exist for a day. Eric Fromm Generally, there are two forms of love, the immature form and the mature one. The immature form of love, also known as symbiotic union, is also of two broad types, the passive form, masochism, and the active form, sadism. Masochism is a symbiotic union that entails submission. A masochist escapes from the painful feeling of separateness by making himself part and parcel of someone else who directs him, guides him, protects him, who everything to him. The masochistic person does not have to make decisions or take risks. He's never alone and he lacks independence and integrity. The active form of symbiotic fusion, sadism, entails domination. The sadist wants to escape from his aloneness by making another person part of himself. By incorporating another person who worships him, he enhances and inflates himself. A sadist lacks independence just as much as the submissive masochist who depends on him. However, the sadist commands, humiliates, exploits, and hurts the masochist. The mature form of love, unlike a symbiotic fusion, is the union that entails the preservation of one's integrity and individuality. Love is a powerful force that breaks the barrier that separates man from his fellow men and unites him with others. In its mature form, love helps man overcome his innate sense of separateness and aloneness, yet allows him to be himself and retain his integrity. This is thus the paradox of love. Two people become one and yet remain two. Chapter 4 In giving of ourselves, we experience joy and true love. Love, according to Eric Fromm, is an activity, contrary to what we all like to believe, a standing in rather than a falling for. The active character of love is evident in the fact that love is essentially giving, not receiving. The common misconception about giving is that it means giving up something, making sacrifices, or depriving oneself of something. Some people are only willing to give when it is in exchange for something else. To such people, giving without receiving is being cheated. Some see giving as an impoverishment, so they don't even bother giving at all. Others turn giving into a virtue in the sense of a sacrifice. They feel that just because giving is painful, then it's something they must do. The idea that it is better to give than to receive to these individuals means that it is better to suffer deprivation than to experience joy. Giving, in the real sense, is the highest form of potency. When we give, we experience our wealth, strength, and power. This experience of enhanced vitality and potency thus fills us with joy. As we experience ourselves as alive, overflowing, and spending, we invariably experience ourselves as joyous. Hence, giving is more joyous than receiving, not because it is deprivation or sacrifice, but because the essence of our aliveness lies in giving. Love is a power that produces love. Impotence is the inability to produce love. Eric Fromm The most important aspect of giving is not to in the material sense, but in the human realm. In love, we give of ourselves, the very best thing we have to the other person. We give our joy, interest, understanding, knowledge, humor, sadness, and all the expressions and manifestations of our being. In giving of ourselves, we enrich the other person's sense of being by enhancing our own sense of being. In truly giving, we make the other person a giver also, and we both share in the joy of what's brought to life in them. In order to develop our ability to love as an act of giving, we must overcome dependency, narcissism, and the wish to manipulate others or to hoard. We must develop the courage to rely on our ability to attain our goals. Those who are afraid to give themselves fully, expecting nothing in return, will inadvertently be afraid of loving. Chapter 5 the active character of love is implied in its four interdependent components. The four major constituents of true love are care, responsibility, respect, and knowledge. Care as an element of love is most evident in a mother's love for her child. If we see a mother who doesn't care for her infant, forgets to feed it, bathe it, and comfort it, we would never believe that she truly loves the child. However, her love for her child strikes us as sincere if we see her caring for the child. We can never truly love something or someone for whom we have no active concern. We love the things we work hard for and work hard for the things we love. 
Love is the act of concern for the life and the growth of that which we love. Eric Fromm Care and concern are even more evident in another element of love, responsibility. We often see responsibility as a duty, something others impose on us. In truth, responsibility is a voluntary act. It is our response to both the expressed and unexpressed needs of others. The only means by which we can thread the thin line between responsibility and domination or possessiveness is through respect. The third element of love. Respect is not fear and awe of others as we like to believe. It is the ability to see someone as they are, to acknowledge their unique individuality. When we respect someone, we actually expect them to grow and develop for their own sake and not for the purpose of serving us. Thus, respect implies the absence of exploitation. It is impossible to respect someone without knowing them. If care and responsibility are not guided by knowledge, they would be blind. In a similar vein, if knowledge isn't driven by concern, it would be empty. To truly love someone else, we must know the person and ourselves objectively. This will enable us to overcome the illusions and the irrationally distorted image we have of them. If you don't know someone objectively, you can't know their ultimate essence in the act of love. Did you know, care, responsibility, respect, and knowledge are a syndrome of attitudes that is only present in a mature person. In order to attain this level of maturity, you must give up your narcissistic tendencies, stop trying to exploit others, desire only the things you've worked for, and be humble. Chapter 6. Love is an orientation of character that determines how we relate to the world. Contrary to conventional opinion, love isn't a relationship we share with a certain person. It is an attitude that determines how one relates to the world as a whole, not to a particular object of love. If you love someone dearly and are indifferent to others, what you have isn't love but a symbiotic attachment and a pompous ego. In our society today, one of the ways by which we show how much we love someone is by letting that person know we love no one else the way we love them. Because the vast majority of us don't see love as an activity, as a force that unites mankind, we believe that all we have to do in life is to find the right object of affection and we'll both live happily ever after. This is one of the grossly absurd notions that has taken root in our modern culture. To better understand how irrational this attitude is, imagine a man who wants to paint. This man has never painted in his life, but instead of learning and mastering the art, he claims that all he needs to do is wait for the right object and he'll make a great, beautiful painting when he finds it. Now, it doesn't take much to see that this person is indeed setting himself up for a big disappointment. The truth is, if you genuinely love someone, then you love everybody, you love the world, and you love life itself. When you tell that person, I love you, what you're essentially saying is, I love the world and everybody in it through you, and in loving you, I love myself as well. Chapter 7. The object of our love determines the kind of love we express. Of course, the fact that love is an orientation of character that doesn't just apply to one person, but to everyone, does not mean there are no differences between the various kinds of love. Based on the type of object which is loved, Eric Fromm outlined five types of love. Brotherly love. Brotherly love is the most fundamental kind of love. It is what underlies all other types of love there is. It is the sense of responsibility, care, respect, knowledge of fellow humans, no matter who they are or where they're from. It is the wish to see any other human being progress. Brotherly love is characterized by its inclusiveness. If you've truly developed the capacity to love genuinely, then you would be able to harbor hatred for your brother or be indifferent towards him. Brotherly love stems from the experience that we all are one, from the human experience, solidarity and atonement, from the union with all men. Our differences, be it in talent, intelligence, knowledge, or socioeconomic background, is negligible compared to what unites us, the identity of the human core common to us all. Motherly love. This is a mother's unconditional affirmation of her child's life and needs. Motherly love implies the care and responsibility needed for the preservation of the child's life and his development. It triggers in the child the love for living and makes him feel that it is great, it is good to be alive, it is great to be a little boy or girl. Erotic love. One thing common to brotherly and motherly love is inclusiveness. They are not restricted to one person. Erotic love, by its very nature, is exclusive. It is the craving for complete fusion with another person. This love is the most deceptive of all kinds of love, and as we've mentioned earlier, it fizzles out just as quickly as it starts. 
Self-love. Many people assume that self-love is the same as selfishness. Eric Fromm says it's not. Here is what the biblical expression, love thy neighbor as thyself, means. The respect we have for our own integrity and uniqueness, the love for and understanding of ourselves, is the same as the respect, love, and understanding we have for another person. Love of God As earlier discussed, the basis for our need to love is in the experience of separateness and the ensuing need to overcome the effect of that separateness by the experience of union. Psychologically, the religious form of love, the love of God, is not different. It stems from our innate need to overcome separateness and achieve union. Chapter 8. The practice of the art of loving requires objectivity and faith in one's love. Now that we've examined the theoretical aspects of love, let's look at the practice of the art of love. According to Eric Fromm, the key to effectively practicing the art of love is overcoming one's narcissism. People with narcissistic orientation believe that the only real thing in life is that which exists in them. Anything that has nothing to do with them has no reality, as far as a narcissist is concerned. They experience everything that happens in the outside world from a viewpoint of those things being useful or dangerous. Objectivity is the exact opposite of narcissism. It is the ability to see someone for who they are, to see them objectively, and separate this objective picture from the fantasized image formed by one's fears and desires. The only way we can think objectively is through reason. And the emotional attitude behind reason is humility. In essence, without achieving an attitude of humility, it's impossible to use one's reason, and hence impossible to be objective. If we want to learn to love genuinely, we must develop humility, objectivity, and reason. We must try to see the difference between our narcissistically distorted picture of people and their actual behavior. The ability to love depends on one's capacity to emerge from narcissism. It depends on our capacity to grow and develop a productive orientation in our relationship toward the world and ourselves. Eric Fromm Another essential condition for loving genuinely is faith. Faith in this context is not a matter of belief in God or in religious doctrines. That's what Eric Fromm calls an irrational faith. The faith we speak of is rational faith, the level of certainty and firmness which our convictions have, not the belief in something. Rational faith is not a specific belief, but a character trait that pervades the whole personality. When we have faith in someone, we are certain of the reliability of their attitude, the core of their responsibility, and their love. Likewise, when we have faith in ourselves, we are aware of a core in our personality which persists through life, regardless of certain changes in circumstances, opinions, and feelings. The practice of the art of loving requires faith in our own love in its ability to yield love in others, and in its reliability. Besides, we cannot be faithful to others if we do not have faith in ourselves, in the persistence of our personality. Conclusion Most of us have the misconception that there is nothing to be learned about love. We see love as a pleasant sensation that we only get to experience as a matter of chance, something we only get to fall into if we are lucky. Contrary to this conversational assumption, however, Love is an art that requires knowledge and effort. Just like any other art, be it painting, medicine, engineering, or carpentry, learning the art of love demands practice, dedication, and concentration. And most importantly, in order to master this art, perfecting our understanding of it must be of ultimate concern. Nothing else on earth must be as important as that art we seek to master, the art of loving. Love isn't a sentiment anyone can simply indulge in, regardless of their level of maturity. It isn't something that sparks in us when the right man or woman comes along. Genuine love is an active character with four major constituents, care, responsibility, respect, and knowledge. Unless one works towards developing their personality and towards letting go of their narcissistic tendency so as to achieve a positive orientation, all attempts at genuine love are bound to fail. We can't love a particular person, not even ourselves, if we don't first develop the capacity to love everyone through humility, faith, discipline, and courage. Try this. Learn to look beyond the surface. In order to experience brotherly love, the most fundamental kind of love, it is essential that we penetrate from the periphery to the core. Be compassionate with others. Give them a chance to prove themselves. Do not relate to people based solely on your assumptions and preconceived notions. If we go around taking people at face value, we'll only tend to see the differences that separate us. If we take the time to look beyond the surface, however, we'll be able to recognize human identity and solidarity. 
We'll realize that the human core common to all men is much greater than any differences each of us might have as individuals.